The topics are really interesting, and we want to finish our topics before 7 p.m. because we have a welcome cocktail. So let, now we're going to talk about the world challenge facing the Trump's tax reform. So we saw the trade part, and in the trade part, it seems that we agreed upon, like between like three countries, and probably this can be extended to other countries of the world. But on the fiscal part, how consistent is the fiscal part with what has been agreed on the trade part? So for this, we invited our dear friend and associate, Juan Antonio Castro Chavez, who is a lawyer for the UNAM. And he graduated from the Autonomous University of Aguascalientes with summa cum laude. He has like more than 20 years of experience in several firms like Chevet Ruiz Amarripe, Cacarem, with custom agents. This is Castro Landeros firm. And he has participated in the design and creation of decrees and several roles of gender of nature. And also, he participated in the creation of pre-validator of CAREM. He has been part of work tables in PRODECUM. And he uh, writes in the review Puntos Finos and in the Foreign Trade uh, Commission in uh, Public Accountants College. Thank Good afternoon. The Today's topic is, uh, is a topic that has shaken the economy of several countries, mainly because this is a message or is a typical message of the current administration of the US led by Mr. Trump in mobilizing or shaken the, the global order. So this new global order proposed by the US has to coincide with a new fiscal regime in order to know how the relationships between the, the taxpayers, the governments, and the people under uh, his government. As the US, particularly the, the Republican era, launched an initiative among many, but the first one that they were granted after many of them, the first one that was granted is the fiscal reform uh, uh, that was passed on last December. We have been one year, well, they have been operating with, with this reform, and it seems that it's given good results. Well, the issue, this reform for Americans has a meaning, uh, uh, repercussion, and it's good well measured because this represents to the government a reduction in the first instance on the tax collection. But they know that this reduction, as they design it, can represent a dynamism of the economy or flows are injected to the economy, and this will generate an increase in their GDP. So they reduced the tax collection, but also increased the GDP at the same time. This is economic design in a very high level. Uh, so le we will see, because of time reasons, all the most important parts of this fiscal reform in the US. The first thing we need to see is what is the goal of the reform? Why the government uh, justified this reform that is to reduce taxes? The first one is to attract more investment, to repatriate capitals from abroad, and to maintain the capital inside the American economy. Very simple. It is like a model that cannot unarguable, the economists will tell me or will measure with, with very accurately the impact. But it, this is the right measure at the glance, but very risky. Well, the most relevant aspects of the reform, as you all know, 
it was a dramatic reduction in the corporate rate on uh, revenue uh, tax, the income tax, the corporate tax of 35% to 21%. The first thing, well, it is kind of surprising a reduction of this magnitude because to reduce one third is something that that it has never been seen in that kind of economies. But if we put this into context, it is not uh, that wrong. We need to consider that the general rate in the OECD countries is a general rate of 22, 24 percent. To leave that in 21 percent, it is not something like it's crazy to do, because most developed countries have been reducing the corporate tax. The second element that we should consider is that this reduction of the 35 percent to 21 percent, we reduce the corporate tax of the federal tax. But let us remember that the 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 tax system is comprised by with uh, of the federal tax corporate tax and there's another part that also uh, taxes the which is the, the state taxes and they go around from zero the states that do not charge this tax, but there are other states that do. It could be 6% or 7%. So if we combine this tax, or this rate, or both rates, so the attractive part of the 21% is no longer attractive. So this can lead us from, 20, from a corporate tax of 25 in average. Well, the second element of the fiscal reform, it is elimination of the minimum tax that existed before as a control tax. In Mexico and in other countries of Latin America, we also maintain a control tax. Let us remember the most recent one was the YETU, the unique rate, entrepreneurial rate, and then we before that we have another kind of tax. They were supplementary, they were control taxes that generated a minimum contribution. The U.S. had that tax and they decided to eliminate it. And this is understandable because in the States, their main tax source is the financial system. Therefore, control is in the financial system. And it is quite strong. The third element an immediate deduction for fixed assets was implemented. This first substantial movement regarding the tax base is pointing out the route of this reform. In concrete terms is that, uh, in our interpretation, is that its design in the states was to attract wealth elements to the U.S. economy and set outside anything which is not relevant. The first element as a wealth factor, it's fixed assets. And as we mentioned, we believe that this measure was the starting point to promote robotization, which is not so strange. Probably in the United States, it is not so attractive to invest in low-wage economies. That's why origin rules demand that the production of vehicles are in those places that have high wages or salaries understood as wages of $16 the hour. Probably then it is not so attractive for the United States to build manufacturing sites outside the United States if this is combined 
with robotization. This is an interpretation that should be assessed or weighed. There's a first movement of this reform, which is quite interesting for several companies. They are encouraged to invest in fixed assets within U.S. territory. Another scheme is the change of world yield by territory earnings. So it makes a big shift in taxation. Then it stops being a taxation system under universal base where we tax residents and we look for all the incomes that you have around the world and now they are by territory everything you generate inside the territory. We will see these later on combined or being coherent with this tax reform design. They are seeking to attract production factors to the territory and the American economy. The previous were the aspects of the reform. Now we will delve into a very important topic. One of the reform stages. We see this tax reform in two stages. The first one is backwards, that it's a Profits until December 2017, the second stage is forward. This stage, and that's why we say that 2017 and backwards stage has this relevant topic of toll charge, which is capital repatriation. What the U.S. government says is U.S. companies that have headquarters in the United States and are suffering all over the world to see where you put your profits, stop suffering. Bring your profits to the United States, those that uh, didn't pay taxes or within a jurisdiction, your profits were not accepted. Pay your taxes in the U.S. at a very attractive rate that goes to around 15% or even 8%. And we will take it as such. You might remember that in a few years ago, with the boom of technology companies, uh, Amazon, Google, and some assembly lines of uh, computer equipment have had a strong income in Euro European communities. Taxation of those profits from these companies in Europe has been highly challenged. Then, the most emblematic case is Google, Amazon, that were headquartered in Ireland. And by means of a ruling, a confirmation where they had a specific tax regime, they were allowed to reduce their contributions Hugely. Ireland is part of the European Union. To the other members of the European Union, this was not so popular. So they tried to force these companies to pay taxes in a more coherent manner. They were not successful. But this case was raised to uh, the economic competition instance. The European Communion imposed a strong sanction to these companies. This is one of the cases. There have been several other cases. 
where the taxation of these companies, especially in Europe, has been questioned. They have had some issues with European jurisdictions. The solution given by the US government to these headquarter companies in the United States is to stop suffering, bring your profits here. If they are rejecting you outside, bring them back home. You will be taxed here and end of suffering. This first movement, we believe, is the huge movement of the US administration, Trump's administration, to inject the US economy a huge amount of economic resources to the financial system. And the economic system, so that's the first stage, facilities to pay taxes in eight annual installments. Second movement, that's backgrounds and in the future. A corporate tax in dividends for foreign companies where the headquarter US company is at least 4%. Again, territorial system. The US acknowledges that these profits, well, promotes that these profits are reintegrated to the US economic system, and for this, it includes an exemption. This is going to be a constant movement, and we will see that the trend in US companies will collect dividends at different jurisdictions. And instead of being taxed at 35 or 21 percent, what the United States does is bring your money here, and you are going to be exempted. So it, again, shows coherence with the territorial system. Another element that seems weird for us, but it is also important, it's that there is a movement implemented in the tax reform starting 2008. 2018, sorry. It's anti-abuse rules that has been promoted by the OCD. That's the bit movement. It seems that the United States is looking for its own bet movement, and it is imposing its specific rules, very similar to what the OECD designed several years ago. These anti-abuse measures are customized in the United States. They are at a tax level. If the US government detects that you have a transaction seeking to reduce your taxes, I'm going to tax you with an additional tax here. That is what they are designing. Those that are familiar with bets, that's a new bet transaction at domestic level. And this topic will be more relevant for related parties. When we see that we want to benefit with some treaties or migrate our profits to low taxation, countries, uh, 
this is usually done through related parties. Now, continuing with the territorial system, there's a tax introduced in the legislation called low imposition on tangible income. The U.S. system says, OK, we're talking about territoriality. If I detect that the corporate company is obtaining profits or untangible profits are taken to a low taxation countries, I will reimpose the world tax system or regime. Even when your profits were obtained in another country, I will make you to pay taxes for those profits here. So this is an exemption of the territoriality figure. There's something that was not incorporated in the presentation, but as a supplementary manner, we can see this measure introduced by the US government. On the contrary, if you obtain profits from intangible assets, and then you obtain income, and this is the wealth source of other countries, then I will reduce your tax base. As you can see, this combo, where they are taxing on tangible assets and they are reducing taxes of intangible assets in foreign countries with this reduction or increase in a very simple manner. What the US is doing is to promote repatriation of intangible. So they wanted to bring back fixed assets, and now they are trying to return dividends and number three, intangible assets as well. Let's remember that a lot of incomes of corporate offices from technology com com companies was the result of intangible assets. And some European jurisdictions, Ireland, the Benelux region, were granting a lot of benefits, uh, probably just one that was substantial to tax on tangible assets. These were the causes of this controversy. This is well understood by the Trump administration, and then the US government said, stop suffering. Do not have your intangible assets which are the main wealth factor, especially in the technological sector. Do not have them there. You're having issues there for taxes. Get back to the United States. Your taxation, it's going to be straightforward. And backwards, you're going to have good benefits. In the future, I'm also going to give you a preferential treat than the one that you had in the European region. We do not know which companies have done that, but we guess that this was an initiative that had good response of this company group. We were talking about these companies because these are the iconic companies However, we believe that we could have much more 
companies in the same situation. They generate intellectual property and then intangible assets migrate to another jurisdiction where they get a friendly taxation rate and that's the way they have operated. It is not exclusively of technological or pharmaceutical companies. There are very sensitive inventions that generate very relevant wealth. Let's continue then. Now let's get back to the design of tax policies. One element that we find is a constraint to interest deduction. Why we have this constraint, the US government says, I will allow you all to get into debt to turn to the financial system or any funding system, but interests are going to be reduced. And I will force you that if you want to turn to funding, you should be successful companies. If you are not having earnings, interests are not going to be reduced. So they put a limit to tax deduction related to the EBITDA or the EBIT. Another constraint is that interests should not exceed 30% of the adjusted taxable income, which is the EBITDA. Another important element at corporate level. Now talking about individuals. We believe that changes are not so relevant at this level. They're just like adjustments or remediation measures, especially because in an economic analysis, we can observe that the main collection on income tax is on individuals and not on companies. This is interesting for individuals, no good news, minimum reduction. They used to pay 39.6%, now they pay 37%. For some entrepreneurial activities, we do have a reduction. That's 20% of income for company activities for transparent entities, typical partnerships, or S corporations. That's uh, individuals, professionals. For individual taxpayers, there was also an elimination or limitation of different deductions and exemptions. We believe that the U.S. reform is not so attractive. They are mere adjustments, and we understand that a new reform or a second stage of this reform is being cooked, which is also targeted to individuals. Now. What can we see? Regarding reactions, especially for these measures where we have a very sensitive interconnection from or of transactions that other country companies make with US companies. The first thing that we can see is reactions of other companies. The first one, a radical one, would be, look, in the States, they are given you away some taxes 
let's go to the United States, let's move. We do not believe that the tax reform of the United States is seeking this. They are looking for re page or this is specifically targeted to U.S. companies with the decision-making level inside the United States. We do not question that maybe other companies want to migrate to the United States, but if they want to make it attractive, they should also migrate administration and other wealth sources to make it more attractive. It is a matter of figures. Each company should assess their cost benefit to know how convenient this radical action would be moving to the United States and especially housing the most important wealth sources. Another scenario that we also considered, which for us seems more feasible, is corporate restructuring. At worldwide level, a series of restructuring measures will take place. Not at corporate level, but operations. Some operations will return to the United States or vice versa. The top natural movement is in intangible assets, which traditionally were in low taxation countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, or Ireland, will migrate to the United States. So the source of collection takes place there in a resident U.S. country, they have these rights, and they will receive these profits that are going to be treated with special benefits. The other restructure will be related to manufacture. In Mexico, this topic is highly sensitive, especially because the automotive, sorry, the maquila industry is based on this manufacture scheme. Production factors are the ownership of a U.S. company and maquila activities or inbound industry activities take place here, especially those activities that have high labor demand. What would it happen if the U.S. starts to introduce technology displacing labor? What would it happen if some automotive transactions take place in the States and they require to generate better wages? If this takes place, then keeping maquila companies in Mexico or in other places like China is not so attractive. For the case of Mexico, these two things may move the structure of maquila industry structure because it could cause a migration movement to the United States, but specifically a migration of companies that stop being attractive due to labor. Let's imagine a typical case. A U.S. headquarter company has a company in Mexico, and its production processes require high labor. But they find a production line which is automated where the same activity can be implemented by a production line which is much more 
economic and efficient. If the investor analyzes that, so it could be attractive. I invest in fixed assets. I will have a deduction, immediate deduction, and I will no longer have labor like uh, costs that are, in, are expensive, and then I will have a whole case. And additionally, I can have intangibles or any other attributes. This scenario would foster that all the manufacturing ac activities would migrate to the U.S. They will be like a, re a, a case on a, on a case by case basis to see how the companies, the subsidiary companies of U.S. companies and the other elements, services. Services don't have a so specific benefit. However, if we consider them in, instead of having help desk services or customer service, Instead of having them in India, probably the Americans would prefer to have them in under their jurisdictions. But this last element, the one of royalties and the interest, we do think that it will have a much a higher impact and we see a migration of intangibles to the US. This is an unavoidable because of the f tax incentives that they would receive in the country. Well, the other important element has to do with dividends. We think that the new tax uh, regime in the U.S. facilitates the reception of all the dividends generated by the subsidiaries of American companies, because when the U.S. receives those dividends, it will be like free or very cheap. So let remember the Americans, they went from 35 percent, 37 percent, the dividends received in the U.S. and maintained them invested in other jurisdictions where they pay less they prefer to have it, have them there. In Ireland, the corporate tax at 12 percent. If they took it to the U.S., they will have to pay a, a complement of 25 percent. So the U.S. would say it, it, it is not convenient for me to take those profits into my country. If the tax uh, corporate tax is reduced to 21 percent. If there's an exemption on dividends, probably this will make the U.S. to uh, release the capital it has in another places and it will bring it to its own uh, economy. So probably in Latin American countries where there's a strong U.S. investment, you will see a, a dividend dividends payment phenomenon, even though we know that it's not that cheap. It, it, it could be cheap in the like in, in that country, but in Mexico it's not that cheap. We need to combine this with uh, the dual uh, taxation uh, agreement. And so let us recap. In manufacturing, where the U.S. has its investment, mainly in Latin America, in Mexico, we have a, a major investment of the U.S., China, Asian, Southeast, and India. Intellectual property, the typical countries are because in these countries, the tax rate and also the legal certainty of those countries that uh, protecting intellectual property. We think that those jurisdictions are the ones that could be seen the most affected with the operations restructuring. The one that we are practically sure that will have the worst shake is the countries where the, the patents reside, 
or the intellectual property rights. Recite, what are the possible reactions of the governments of the other countries? And we can say this about Latin American governments and also Mexican government. What are we going to see on the Mexican government side is to have an incentive to reduce the the income tax, not a reduction of companies, probably not, but the reduction of, of uh, operations so that the operations can migrate. So we will have to carry out a more detailed analysis because the nominal rate could maybe the nominal rate of 21% that the U.S. has, it is not the effective rate. Let us remember the limitations to the reduction of interest where, where there's like a cutoff to the, of the deductions. We have a situation that is not included in the slide, but the fiscal losses in the U.S. can no longer be 100% deductible. The fiscal losses generated are reduced at 80% of the profit they generate. If you had a fiscal lo accumulated fiscal loss of 300, and this exercise in this fiscal ex uh, year you had a profit of 100, you can deduct 80, and at least you're going to pay on a 20. A basis of 20. Previously, you can deduct the the 100, 100. So we need to measure the effective rate as well. Also, the effective rate. But I have one concern. We respect the laws. And what about the proportion that you do not use in that fiscal period? But always is the 80. Yeah, it's all. It's always the 80 percent. So, and and when it comes to losses and interests, is to to push to generate profits, because if the losses are not at the same pace of profits, you will start to lose the right to amortize them. And this has to do, the effective rate and the taxable rate has to be uh, assessed. The effective rate and the nominal rate has to be assessed. The effective rate goes hand in hand with the taxable base. It could be, it, it, it would seem that it's a reduced rate, but you're not allowed to fully reduce your fiscal losses or interest. Probably it is not that attractive anymore. The other reason is taxes do not determine competitiveness. So the main reason by which one U.S. company decides to leave its investment in one place or to take the investments back to the U.S., it represents the competitiveness of the whole package. What is offered by a country cannot only be or should be measured on the the tax, income tax that you will charge me, but also the access to the markets. What's the the how skilled the labor is and the amount of resources to produce the geographical location. There's n things. The energy costs. Fortunately, in Mexico, it seems that they are uh, they have been reduced. But there are some things that will make us to be cautious on the measures that will be taken. So the first movement as a reflex, probably we can reduce taxes, probably is not the best measure. Also, I think competitiveness of our countries should be determined or should be uh, like foster under other factors, not only the fiscal one. One measure that could be expected is increase of consumption taxes. The value added tax, the YEPs, where it's a matter of tax policy, but we don't, we do not see like something like once we see that this can be done. Also to increase the, the, 
the taxpayer database and is to make to streamline all the fiscalization in mexico we have a fiscalization rate that is really low in proportion to the gdp is really really low well only as a wrap to wrap up how are we doing in terms of time well as a wrap up what what do we need to see in the transactions or that the companies of our countries well that have to do with the US the first thing is to take care all the accreditation uh, issues well well regardless of what is happening or the migration of intangibles or migration of activities or to return production lines to the US, which is what Mr. Trump wants, or the main goal is to return all the, the, the job sources to the US. We do not know if this goal will be achieved, but we are sure is that a repatriation of capitals to the US in uh, like unprecedented uh, on the activity uh, the daily activities is to assess now that in the US the tax rate will be reduced the accre accreditation of the taxes of our countries paid in the US the difference of rates is going to be very sensitive issue probably you, we will see uh, a potential renegotiation of agreements to avoid dual taxation and in this way in the source we will have high rates also the application of the treaties to avoid dual taxation will be much more relevant mainly because here in the source country, the withholding, tax withholding uh, will continue to happen because of the intangible royalties. It's going to be complicated um, when we talk about fiscalization. Why? Because traditionally, it's 10% of what the uh, what remains in the source country, probably in the US, will look for renegotiations to avoid uh, taxation of half of the total t tax. Well, those are typical cases that we will see in the daily operations where the foreign subsidiary delivers dividend in uh, American headquarters, a Peruvian subsidiary that will have to give dividends to the American company. What's going to happen? What are the shares or what is the impact in the Peruvian company that delivers dividends and to deliver ta that deliver taxes to the American company. What happens if this Peruvian, Colombian, or Mexican company decides to go to the US and be based there and starts collecting well, dividends of their subsidiaries or the opposite? What happens if our companies of our country stay in the country but they decide for some reason to take some operations to the US, which is not awkward. So it creates an intangible. Instead of posting it in Colombia, I take it back to the US, and probably I will pay less. What's going to happen with the dividends that are, that are sent by the subsidiary of this Colombian company that is in the US when they send those to the Colombian uh, headquarters. The services, the intangibles, well, all the related parties, transfer prices, and also the so-called tax, the BEAT, B-E-A-T, which is the, the regionalized, uh, yeps. You want to bring the intangibles? Okay, do that, but don't but you, 
you will not be allowed to take the profits. The profits generated by the intangibles have to be taxed in the U.S. in a reasonable way, and I will put blocks to it. In the territory, is really consistent. So this is a, a consistent design. And likewise, the services payment of intangibles from a resident abroad and vice versa. One last uh, insight, and the most recent one. In Mexico, we have a measure that is known as or a control structure that we know it as refipre. So those cases where a Mexican company has investments in subsidiaries abroad. When when this subsidiary abroad is resides in a, in a low taxation country and obtains like liabilities like by dividends, interest, or royalties, what we do is that the headquarters, the Mexican headquarters company, is obliged to accumulate those revenues obtained by the subsidiary abroad and is obliged to pay for those revenues in Mexico. What is the requirement? So that the jurisdiction will be considered low taxation. What is the parameter? There, they will pay seven. The tax that will be paid there will be lower than 75% of the tax that is going to be paid here in Mexico. Here in Mexico, our nominal rate is 30%, so 75% is around 22.5%. And the U.S. has 21%. Automatically, it would lead us to think that the U.S. is under a low taxation jurisdiction, and you will need to bring the revenues of the subsidiary there and bring those to Mexico. But there's one clarification that states this parameter should be measured globally. If the profit is, is taxed at the federal and state levels, both re taxes will be joined and to know if they are lower than 75%. So the Mexican case was already clarified. I don't know, we should, we should assess this in South America. What are the parameters that you have there for these measures? Well, well, this is like the most relevant aspects, believe me. This is a, a a really uh, major reform, and we're still on the way on obtaining the regulations, the rules, the IRS, the uh, continuous working to uh, issue rules that would clarify everything that the congressmen and sen senators wanted to say. The authority is still issuing rules and and still is la launching things. He, it hasn't concluded all the regulation of the reform. All the important things have been working well, but there's a long way to go. If you have a uh, a comment, or you have a question, or a specific uh, comment, please go ahead. Well, thank you for your attention. And let's see how this topic evolves. A big round of applause. Thank you. Well, I'm going to grant this recognition to, well, UCCS America grants the following recognition to Juan Antonio Castro Chavez for his participation as a, a speaker in this yearly meeting. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.